Let's pray. Lord, you are the giver of life. Without you, we have no life. Without your mercy, we're still in our sin. There's nothing inherent in us that we can live a righteous life without your intervention. We thank you for your great mercy. We pray tonight that we can learn the responsibility that faith in you comes with and not confuse it with your grace, but see it in the light of your totality of your word. We pray this in your holy name. Amen. Tonight's lesson, James teaches us that faith without works is dead or useless. Does he mean that we need faith and works to be saved? We just finished Paul. And Paul's big message is faith alone and Messiah alone, Christ alone. So who's right? And then Jesus teaches us, let your light shine before others and so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father in heaven. Now I'm really confused. Who's right? Did that go through your head to, uh, as you did your lesson? This is what we're going to try to answer tonight. Keep this in your mind. Our good works glorify God. Now those, you can see I've been tortured a little bit trying to figure out how to do this. And then I figured that a picture is worth a thousand words. This is a picture of my daughter's uh, hand that post-surgery she had this morning. She had to have some ligaments moved around so that she could move her thumb again. Everything's successful. But she's a teacher, and she has four of my seven grandchildren. And in her mind, I mean, her grandch my grandchildren are eight, six, five, and two. And she's a full-time teacher. But she's practical. So she's looking at her hand, and here's what her question is. How do I get my bra on? <laughs> our salvation, think of our hand as being our salvation. Jesus saved us from all our sins, and we're all wrapped up, and now we're going to have freedom of moving, movement again. But now that we're there, what do we do? And that's what these Jews were being confronted with by James. I asked permission, Nikki, so don't get mad at me. <laughs> and it's not you, because your hands are, you can, put, there you go. When you have three daughters, you tread on thin ice all the time, trust me. So that's what we're trying to uh, look at tonight. And James starts out, my brothers, show no partiality as you hold the faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory. So what is faith? In Hebrews, they define faith. Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. And then in verse 6 of Hebrews 11, it says, Without faith it is impossible to please God. For he who comes to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of those who believe in him. So where is works in all that? So how is it that James can say, faith without works is dead? So let's look at our lesson as we start reading. For if man is wearing a gold ring and fine clothing and comes into your assembly, that word assembly in some of your Bibles that says meeting is synagogue. It's the same word they use in the Greek Old Testament that says synagogue. And if you look at the asterisks of some of your Bibles, it will footnote it and say synagogue. So these were Jewish believers. They're 10 years out from coming in the faith, the oldest ones. They've already been persecuted and scattered. And now they're in their congregations and they're trying to work through 
what this life and faith is. We got 2,000 years of how to do this, and we have the written word. The only scripture they had was Jesus' Bible. The Hebrew scriptures are what most people call the Old Testament. That's all they had. And now they have to work this out. Now how are they going to do that? So James, the practical teacher he is, says we got a rich man who comes in. And he's wearing gold and stuff. And they give them the seat of honor. And then a poor man comes in you say, go stand in a corner or... Some of your versions say, sit, on, uh, sit under the footstool or at my feet. In the synagogue at that time, remember in the Gospels where it said the, the Pharisees like to come to the seat of honor? Those were the benches. There's, I mean, everybody crawls into a small place. And there's only a few of these elevated benches sitting around. They have a, uh, a few footstools. So the commoners would have to stand or sit on the floor. And James is, so these guys are well aware of what's going on because that's their life. And he says, you know, that's not right. In Leviticus 19.15, and I'm going to do a quick advertisement. Next year, our study is going to be from the Jordan River, no, it's from the, from the um, Red Sea to the Jordan River. And it's a study of Exodus, Leviticus, not all of it, and Numbers. But one of the holiest books in the Bible is Leviticus, and Leviticus 19 is the holiest chapter. And if you cringe at that, let me tell you, Jewish boys and girls, by the time they're eight years old, have this memorized, the whole book. So we can study it and learn a lot. But here's what it says. You must not deal unjustly in judgment. You must neither show partiality to the poor nor honor the rich. That's what their, Jesus' Bible says. Yet, they're putting a rich man on a, on a nice seats on the bench and they're telling the poor man to sit on the floor. And God said it shouldn't be that way. Listen, my beloved brothers, has not God chosen those who are poor in the world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom which he promised to those who love him? There is no difference between male or female, Jew or Gentile, rich or poor, free or slave. We're all one in Messiah. And James is Kind of slap them around a little bit. Think about what you're doing. But you have dishonored the poor man. Are not the rich ones who oppress you and the ones who drag you into court? Are they not the ones who blaspheme the honorable name by which you are called? A couple things. At that time, most of the persecution of the Jews came from rich, whether they were Jewish rich or Gentile rich. They're the ones who did it. And you know, they take them to court. And if you're a poor man, it's a hard thing to fight a rich man in court. Uh, I just heard Mark Zuckerberg was in an argument with his neighbor and he, they couldn't settle, so he took him to court. How would you like to fight a guy like that? He could just wear you down on legal fees. And that's what James is talking about. He said, this is not right. These guys are rich in faith. God has blessed them just like he's blessed you. And you give, and the other thing, of course, on the rich people coming into the synagogue, hey, we could use some more benches. We could use something. So it's always about the money. You know, you got to follow the money trail. But here's what he says, and let me give you a little, the Hebraism behind this where it says, are they not the ones who blaspheme the honorable name? James is saying the name. In Hebrew, Hashem. That's the name that they'll use a lot of times in Hebrew scriptures for God. Hashem, the honorable name. Hashem. 
So they're dishonoring God. When I say Hashem, it almost sends shiver through me. Who are you talking about? The name. Everybody knows who they're talking about. And they're talking about the very name of God. And it's not right. And we do it today just like they did it 2,000 years ago. You are in a church congregation in a very nice Armani suit comes in with a Rolex and a wife with a uh, uh, fur coat on and they come in and sit, trust me, they're going to get a place of honor. If you come in in blue jeans and stuff, maybe not so much. Let me tell you a story that happened 35 years ago to me. Uh, I was talking to this scholar, it was at the Luzane Conference on Jewish Evangelism. It was here in Minneapolis. And this guy who was a scholar, he, he had two PhDs. He was a young guy. He must have been uh, uh, his father's nightmare. He's probably in school all his life because he wasn't over 35 and he had two PhDs. How do you do that? He spent a lot of time in school and now he's writing a paper. And he was telling the story how God rebuked him for his pride in his scholarly work. He was at a conference and there was a guy sweeping the floors, putting the chairs in order, and he was an older man, and he was uh, trying to get everything in line, and, and he was, this guy was telling me the story, he said, I was talking to another scholar, and I was disagreeing with this great scholar uh, in a piece that he wrote. He's a great Hebrew scholar who became a believer. And uh, the man sweeping the floor can tell me, what's your problem? He said, well, you wouldn't understand it. So said, no, I, I'd really like to hear. You know, I, I'm trying to be a good student. And the guy said, this is really heady stuff. You won't understand. He said, no, try me, just please. And he explained it to him. And he said, you know, when I wrote that, I never considered that. <laughs> it was Rockmail Friedland, one of the most educated <laughs> believers Jewish believers in the world at that time, rabbis used to try to dispute him, but they couldn't because he graduated at the top of his class at every prestigious yeshiva in the world, Jewish higher edu place of education. And I sat there and I said, what a marvelous story. So he looked down at this guy because he was in jeans and sweeping. You know why? Because he was so humble, the janitor was sick, and he said, I'll do it. So he took off his suit and stuff, and he set up everything. So don't judge a book by its cover. I, you know, it just doesn't work, but we do that every day. And the guy was humbled, and that's what James is telling these guys. Don't do that. Don't do that. It's a sin. And now he goes even deeper into this. Let's take a look at the second part. In verse 8 it says, If you really fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself, you are doing well. But if you show partiality, you are committing sin and are convicted by the law as a transgressor. There are 613 commandments for Jews out of the Hebrew Scriptures, the Old Testament. They come up with 613 commandments. And they go on in that section to say if you don't keep them all, so in other words, if you keep 613 and you fail on one, you failed on them all. I can't even comprehend keeping 613. And... What he is saying, if you don't do the royal law, love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, and soul. That's uh, Deuteronomy 6.4. And then the royal law is to love your neighbor as yourself. See, we as believers and followers of Jesus, we don't have 613 commandments. We have two. I don't know about you, but I have a hard time keeping two. I don't know how you keep 613. But what he's saying to him, if you show partiality, it's a sin. But then he goes on, and you are convicted by the law as transgressors. I don't know how you read that. Is that just another way of saying sin? In the Hebrew, it's pesha. 
for transgressor, and it means rebellion. And here's how you define it. God, I'm not doing what you want me to do. It's the most serious, grievous sin you can have. In fact, in the Hebrew, in the temple time, there is not a sacrifice that can cover the crime of transgression. Shaking your fist at God, there is no remission of that sin. You got to wait until you go before the judgment seat of God. Now, aren't we fortunate that we have the blood of Jesus covering that? But this is serious stuff, and that's what, that's what uh, um, James is trying to tell them. In verse 12, so verse 12 it says, So speak and so act as those who are being judged under the law of liberty. Each one of those Jewish believers have been set free from the bondage of sin by their faith in Jesus. Now they need to show mercy to anyone coming in, including the poor person that comes in who needs help, including those who have wronged you. We were set free by God's mercy when we were dead in our sins, therefore we are called to show mercy. And if we don't show mercy to people coming in and showing them grace, no matter who they are, we are guilty of a transgression. It sounds harsh, but Jesus himself said, if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your heavenly uh, Father forgive your trespasses. If you don't forgive, and if you don't sh show love, you know what happens? You keep sinning this way. In Hebrews 12, 15, it says, See to it that no one fails to obtain the grace of God, that no root of bitterness springs up and causes trouble, and by many of it be defiled. If you keep pushing back on God, and you don't show mercy, and if you don't show love, you're going to sin, and if you don't deal with that, Sooner or later, the root of bitterness is going to come in and it's going to rob you of your life and faith. That's what James is telling them. you got to stop this. Remember I told you that story earlier in the year about Aziz, Azam, Mubarak? He could show mercy to anybody that came in. He could show grace. He didn't care who it was. He would love them and show them. He wasn't a respecter of people. But you know how he did that? Because realizing how he received mercy from God. He was a pirate. He raped people. He killed them. He stole their money. And then when he became a believer, his father was so incensed, he cut his mother up in parts and sent him a, a package with her body in it, wrapped in a bowl. And the guys who did it, he ran into one night walking to their synagogue, their assembly. And those guys saw him and they were afraid. They were reaching for their knives and he forgave them. Why? Because they received mercy. And he forgave them. It's just mind-boggling. He brought them to their fellowship and they became believers. He gave them the seat of honor. That's what we're called to do. And that's what James is called to do. Think of the mercy you received, the love. Not one of us are, are free from the use of that. We're not called to judge. We're called to show mercy and love and welcome everyone. And then Paul talks about, the, I mean, James talks about uh, faith and works. And Paul talks about faith alone and Christ alone. They both use the same story from Genesis 22. 
Paul is talking to those who have never received faith. James is talking to those who are already saved. And that's the difference. And he's saying, your faith that you, that you put in Jesus and received your forgiveness. Now let me see the transformation so that your light can shine before people. So how do we do all this? It's like my daughter's hand. Now the practical stuff. How do I live this way? And they, James used Genesis 22. And the story, that's when God came to Abraham after he's been walking with the Lord for 50 years. And he said to him, take your son, your only son, and go sacrifice him as a burnt offering on the mountain where I'll show you. So Abraham had to walk for three days thinking about this. But God, you promised you would bless me through Isaac. Now how can I sacrifice Isaac and you keep that promise? You're not a liar. Can you imagine what's going through his head? I can tell you that'd be going through mine. What does Hebrew says? He says, ah, after 50 years, God has always been faithful. You know, he could resurrect Isaac. So he was going to do it. And then, oh, you got to be kidding me. Let me get to it real quick. So then he gets there, and he's going to lower the knife on, on Isaac, and the Lord stops him. And he gives him a ram instead of his son. And in verse, in um, Genesis 22, 14, it says, And Abraham named the place the Lord will provide. So today it is said, it will be provided on the Lord's mountain. Let me translate that in Hebrew. The word the Lord will provide is Yahweh Yari. And the way that's translated is in two ways. It's a play on words. And so what Abraham is saying is, and Abraham named that place Yahweh Yari. And provide could be also translated sees. Look at the footnotes of your Bible. The Lord sees Abraham's trying to be faithful. And then he repeats the word again, so he provides. The Lord sees whatever circumstance we're in and our heart after him, so he provides for us whatever we need. He sees and he provides. That's the promise of God. That's the grace of that James is talking to these Jewish believers about. In that story, they understood it. The Lord sees and he'll provide. So why do I show favoritism to that rich man? I don't have to. Because the Lord is seeing my faithfulness of trying to love and show love to each equally. And he'll provide everything I need. So I don't have to run after this rich man for what I need. The Lord sees that I can, I've been hurt by this person, they've cut me to the core of my being. And he's seen I'm trying to forgive and he will provide the way through the Holy Spirit. He'll provide that we can just let this go so that we can live. The Lord sees and he'll provide. Our good works glorify God. Truly, we can only do this by the power of the Holy Spirit that lives in us. We need to trust God in all circumstances. We need to demonstrate the royal love in every interaction with other people. Showing favoritism is a sin and not demonstrating the royal love. Not showing love for especially the people in our own congregations, but those from the outside world is a sin. So we need to extend love in all circumstances, even when it seems impossible. 
even when we've been greatly hurt, even to the very hard to love, if we can so humble ourselves to submit to the Lord, he will provide for us because he sees the struggle we have. He is glorified by our desire to be obedient and he'll provide a way for us to do it. The question is, do we believe it? That's what's going to provoke the world to the godly jealousy. And selfishly for me, in Romans 11, where it says, and all Israel will be saved, you know how they're going to be saved? When Gentiles can show that kind of love that blows their mind away, and they're going to ask the question, how can we be saved? So that's what James is teaching us. Are we willing to do that? It's not easy. But the Lord will see us do it, and he'll provide. Let's pray. Thank you, God, for your word. Your word is true. We pray now, Lord, that we can learn from this message. That we come to you by faith alone and Christ alone. But when we're there, that faith transforms our life. It always is transformative. And help us to demonstrate that. Even if it's a little step, Lord, it could be a great step for those who are looking in on us. So we pray for that kind of power and that kind of love. And we pray that we can extend mercy and grace to those who have hurt us. Because we receive more earth mercy and grace that we can even comprehend for our lives. We pray this in your holy name. Amen.